guys ready for the word? Got your Bibles? Okay, get them. Get them in your hands. You're going to be sitting for a long time. So honor the Lord. If you have the ability to stand to your feet, I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord together in prayer today. Father, we thank you for your presence in this place. God, thank you for what you've already done in this church service, Lord, that heaven has touched earth, God, and you've heard our prayers, Lord, and that you are answering them, that you are changing the world we live in. God, we thank you so much that today we get to come together and not just stop there, Lord. That would have been great if we just had what we already had in church today, but God, we want to go farther with you. We want to go deeper. So Lord, as we open up your word today, God, we pray that you would open it up to us. Open up our eyes to see and our ears to hear. Open our hearts to have the good understanding. May we be the good ground where the word is sown and may it produce fruit in each and every one of our individual lives. God, today we acknowledge that it's not a man or a woman, not the young or the old, the black, the white, the brown, any other color we could imagine. But God, it's you and your Holy Spirit that teaches the church. So welcome, Holy Spirit. Be our teacher. Be our guide. Give us your vision, your wisdom, your instruction, your direction, even the correction we need for our lives, Lord. And we'll give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor for it. God, we don't just ask this blessing upon ourselves, also we'd ask it for all the churches, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet, that are both preaching and hearing the gospel today, God. We pray that you bless them as you would bless us. So we bless our Baptist brothers and sisters, Lutherans, Methodists, Episcopalians, Charismatics, Pentecostals, God. We thank you for Calvary Chapel, for Harvest, for Oak Valley, God, for Ecclesia and Trinity and Emmanuel Baptist, for the Way, for Sandals, God, for the Foursquare Denominations, Lord, and for the Assemblies of God, for the Church of God in Christ, Lord, as well for our Adventist brothers and sisters and our Catholic brothers and sisters, God, if they're lifting up the name of Jesus, preaching your gospel truth, Lord, we bless them this day as you would bless us. And God, also, we don't forget our persecuted brothers and sisters scattered abroad throughout the world. Lord, we love them and we pray that you encourage them, that you bless them, you protect them, God, watch over them and deliver them, Lord. May they endure to the end to the glory of God. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray in agreement and we say, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated today. Get your Bibles out and go with me to Hebrews, the 11th chapter. We started a series two weeks ago called Humble Faith. Hebrews 11 chapter is really the hall of faith, if you will. Many scholars, many commentators over the years have called it the hall of faith. In Hebrews 11 chapter, you will find that uh, the author writes down and, and just kind of outlines great men and women throughout the Bible who we can see what they did in faith. Now, oftentimes you'll see it says, by faith they did this, by faith they did that. And now we come to Hebrews 11, chapter, verse number 32, and it says this. And it says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and of the prophets. Now, last time we were together, we took a look at the life of Gideon. This was the first guy that God brought up. And then uh, as we go throughout this series, we're going to take a look at the humble faith of these other men that are outlined here in the scriptures. I want to just remind you of a couple of things that we said first thing that we saw about these men was that the common thread in those mentioned is that in the natural, they all had failures and they all had flaws, and yet God used them mightily to accomplish his will. I made the statement, despite our failures and flaws, we can move forward with God and do great things through humble faith. In other words, it's good news that God brought up Gideon. And God brought up Barak, and God brought up Samson, and God brought up Jephthah, and God brought up David. Why? Because even though these are great men who did great exploits here on the earth, all of them had major flaws and glaring failures and things that God just opens up. I mean, with David, it's almost shameful when you take a look at his life, the things that he went through, adultery and murder and uh, numbering the children of Israel just in direct disobedience to what God had spoken to him. And yet God calls him a man after his own heart and sets up the lineage of Jesus Christ through this king, David. So if God can use a guy like that who's such a rascal, who made so many mistakes and had so many failures, how much more can God do through you and through me despite our flaws and despite our failures if we will humble ourselves in faith? Now, you remember also that we had to define what humility is. There's a lot of hum bull out there about what being humble really is. And sometimes people think that in order to be humble, you've got to just beat yourself up. You've got to be lowly. You've got to be nothing. You've got to be a gutter sucker. You've got to just be down there in the dumps, the dregs of society. Never have anything. Never influence anyone. No one knows who you are. You never elevate to anything. And that's called being humble. That's a bunch of baloney, guys. What does humility mean from the Bible? Very simple. Very easy. To be humble in the Bible means you are depending on God. That's all it is. It's so simple that, listen, God, I'm depending on you for this. I, I can't depend on myself because I can't do it on my own. God, I need you. I need Jesus. That's humility. You had to humble yourself 
in order to even receive salvation. Because you had to say, God, I can't save myself. I need you to take me out of this mess of sin and death that I'm in right now. And God reaches down and he gets a hold of your life. And the Bible says, if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, that he will lift you up, that he will exalt you in due time. Therefore, we need to model the faith that we see in these great men and women here in the Bible and model the example of humble faith. Now, remember in the book of Judges, we talked about this when we talked about Gideon last time, that there was a cycle that they went through. If you want to turn to Judges chapter 4 while I'm talking to you about this, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Judges, the fourth chapter. We're going to be taking a look at the life of Barak. Judges chapter number 4, and by the way, it's not Barack Obama, okay? You just thought you saw the president in the Bible? No, different guy, okay? Judges chapter 4, the cycle is going on. There's deliverance, there's great uh, blessing, there's battles won, there's victory, there's prosperity. Children of Israel enjoy a time of peace. In that time of peace, in that time of rest, their hearts start to wander from God and they start to choose for themselves new gods. As they do that, the hand of God comes off of the children of Israel. The blessings of God are removed and now the nations around them start to rise up and they start to oppress the children of Israel. They start to bring them under bondage and bring them under their government and their rule. And this goes on for decades, and as that goes on, the children of Israel realize, you know what? We've forgotten about God. We've forgotten about the one who delivered us from Egypt. We've forgotten about this great and mighty God who made promises to Israel. He is our covenant God. And so what do they do? They cry out to the one true God, and they say, God, we're in a mess. God, we can't get ourselves out of this. They humble themselves, and they call out to God, and they say, God saves us. God save us. Therefore, God hears from heaven, and God reaches down, and he delivers the children of Israel. Oftentimes you'll see in the book of Judges that he does that through a deliverer. He raises up a judge, somebody who can come up and who can decide what's good and what's evil in the sight of the Lord and who also will come in and bring about the military victories that they need in order to come out of the oppression that they're in. Now when we stop depending on God, when we are no longer humble, when we start saying, I can do this, And maybe there's been some great battles you come out of. Maybe you've been delivered from drugs. Maybe you've been delivered from pornography. Maybe you've been delivered from sin. You started coming to church and you were excited and you were on fire. And then you kind of plateaued and you got comfortable. You started enjoying yourself and you said, you know what, I got this. I'm good. You know, I don't really need to read the Bible anymore. I I think I've got a good grasp of that. read through it once and and I think we're we're good now. I, I know that. You stopped praying so much because you didn't really need God as much. It wasn't a desperation thing anymore. And and it started to get casual. It started to get stagnant. See, we will find ourselves in this same cycle that the children of Israel did where they have peace and prosperity and then they start to wander and then they start to come under bondage and then as they're in that bondage, they start to cry out to God and then they cry out to God and then they're delivered and then they have peace and prosperity. We will find ourselves in that same cycle if we're not careful and we don't stay in humility. See, when something or someone else takes the place of God in our hearts, it becomes an idol to us. Sometimes we bow ourselves to the idol of recreation. You know, you start to prosper, you start to get blessed, and you say, you know what, I've always wanted to have a boat, I've always wanted to have a sand rail, I've always wanted to have a dirt bike or something like that. Now, there's nothing wrong with having those things. God is not concerned about you having things. But God is concerned about things having you. And and if your weekend exploits start to take the place of your church attendance and your relationship with God, you're going to find yourself having a problem. And therefore, it's very uh, important that we take care of our hearts. Some people have bowed down to the job. And for years and years and years, they, they never worked. They didn't have a job. And they strove. And they, they, they were working hard to get to a point where they could have a good job. And all of a sudden, God blesses them. And business starts booming. And they've got all sorts of things. And, and now they've got all sorts of business. And they start taking work on their church time because, you know, i got to keep the business going. I, I didn't have a job before. And all of a sudden, that job becomes an idol in their life. And they start to bow themselves before that job. Some people, their families, the same way. Maybe they're working hard six days a week and they don't really have another day off. And you know, Sundays are, are, are supposed to be for church. But you know what? My family, I haven't spent any time with them. And if I go to church, you know, the kids are over there in the children's ministry and they're young and I need to be with them. And so they stop their church attendance. They start getting up. Well, the kids need to go to sports. And all of a sudden the baseball games and the soccer games and the family time and the pizza parties and all that kind of stuff starts to replace our relationship with God. And we bow ourselves down before the idol of having an ideal family in our society, and it replaces God, and then we wonder where God is in times of trouble. When we have separated ourselves from God, we've taken ourselves out of a position of humility and depending on God, and now all of a sudden, our hearts have gone astray. 
And the devil comes in in those times and he racks us, beats us from pillar to post. See, whenever this happens, we open ourselves to be mastered by someone other than God. Remember what God told Cain? He told him, sin lies at the door. But you should rule over it, but its desire is to master you. See, sin will always try and master us. Sin will always try and raise up a false God, a false image that we will serve and we will bow down to rather than humbling ourselves and bowing down before God Almighty, the one true God. Judges chapter 4, we see this cycle going on. And in verse number 2, it says, So the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who dwelt in Harosheth Hagoyim. Now, it's interesting to note that this king Jabin who reigned in Hazor bears the same name as another Canaanite king who reigned in the same city in Joshua's time. Now Joshua defeated that king in that time. But the children of Israel did not wipe out the Canaanites like God had commanded them to. Can I tell you something? If you don't deal with your issues now, later on in life your issues will deal with you. If you mess with sin now, sin will mess with you later on. In other words, if you don't stop things right now, if you don't master these things right now, then you'll be fighting the same battles by the same name in the same place later on in your life, just like the children of Israel. Don't mess with sin, because sin will mess with you. David Jackman said incomplete victories are a sure recipe for future defeat. So we need to learn how to win the battles, and I believe that humble faith is the way that we're going to win these battles. Look at... a. Judges chapter 4, verse number 3. This time we're going to read through verse number 7. Look at what it says. It says, And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. They finally humbled themselves under the mighty hand of God. And it says, For Jabin had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he had harshly oppressed the children of Israel. Now that iron chariots was the most advanced, most technological warfare of that day. It'd be like us saying that he had a bunch of aircraft carriers or he had a bunch of drones or he had a bunch of nukes or something like that. It'd be like us saying, you know, I'm going to go fight with this pistol when they've got a tank. You just get wiped out by him. And so that was what was going on here. It didn't matter how big of an army you could muster. If you didn't have an iron chariot, you were going to get wiped out. Next verse, look at what it says, though. It gives us the light of the hope of what God is doing. Verse number four, it says, Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time time. Now, can we stop there for a moment and talk about something? Can we take a little rabbit trail? Is that okay? It's okay to answer the preacher today. This is an interactive sermon, okay? I'm going to need you to say amen. I'm going to need you to say hallelujah. Some of y'all need to get a hanky to wave, okay? Because we're going to go there today, but I need you to get involved. I don't need you to be brain dead because if you're brain dead in this place, you're going to walk out of here and the devil's going to punch you in the gut and you're going to wonder, where's God? I was just in church. No, you were not in church. You were somewhere off dreaming in in the regions of Wonderland, talking to a smiling cat somewhere, and and then you're wondering, why isn't God coming on my behalf? Listen, you got to interact. You got to get a hold of this today otherwise go home okay not gonna let you sit here and be brain dead all right too much of that's going on this is not you're not watching tv right now you're in church hello okay tv sports all that kind of stuff video games all that everybody's staring dead and you just sit there duh, duh, duh. no this is church you are the church so get involved in it today is it okay if we take a rabbit trail All right, there we go, there we go. This is Deborah. Obviously, this is a woman under the old covenant who is a prophetess and who is judging Israel. Let's chop that up for a second. What is a prophet? A prophet is somebody who foretells and foretells the will and the way of God. In other words, she represents God to the people. In the Old Testament, they had the first five books of the Bible, Okay, the Pentateuch, this was the law of Moses, you will find, okay? They were still writing the historical books, they were still writing, they were living all this stuff. The prophets hadn't come on the scene yet, okay, so they did not have the Bible like we have it today. They had no New Testament, they didn't have any of that. All they had was the first five books of the Bible, and they did not have printing presses, and not everybody had that in their home. That's why the Sabbath was so important that they would gather at the synagogue, they would gather at the tabernacle, they would gather at the temple, and they would take out the scroll, and they would read the word of the Lord, and they would rehearse it, and they would sing it together, and they would memorize it. Why? Because not everybody had a Bible. 
Therefore, in order to understand the will of the Lord, they had to either go to the representative there at the synagogue or at the temple or at the tabernacle, or the prophet would come, and the Spirit of the Lord would come upon the prophet, and they would declare the will and the way of God for the people. So if the prophet came to town, it was as if God was coming to town. That's how important this was. Now remember, we in the American church for hundreds of years have said women must be silent in church based on two verses in the New Testament, okay? Now, I understand out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every matter be established. But did you know that the word for woman and the word for wife can be interchangeably used? That's very interesting because when you think about that, if it says let a woman be silent at church but let her talk to her husband, why didn't it say her man? So why would we use woman in one context and husband in the other context? Shouldn't it be a husband and wife? So therefore, what's it saying? It's saying, ladies, don't be a distraction in church. We know you all like to talk, okay? And we know you got the spaghetti thing. Men, men are like waffles. We're very focused. We can get in our box, right? But women are like spaghetti. Everything touches and everything. And, and I could be talking about something, using an example about children, and all of a sudden, hey, did you, did you make the doctor's appointment for the children? Listen, you know what the Apostle Paul saying? He's saying, shut up, ladies. You can ask your husband about that later, all right? Right now is church time, so be quiet. That's what he's saying. Listen, are there other prophets in the Bible? Yes. Okay. Are there other female prophets in the Bible? Yes. Okay. Deborah, Miriam, Hulda, Anna in the New Testament who came and met Jesus as a little boy, right? And then you got Philip the evangelist, great evangelist. He had daughters who prophesied. Where did they prophesy? Uh, maybe in church, you think? Hello? And yet we're so stupid, we think, oh, no, women have to be, no woman can teach, no woman can do anything. Why are we crippling half the body of Christ when God does not cripple half the body of Christ? God uses women in church. And listen, this is a woman under the old covenant. Aren't we under a new covenant? Aren't we under a better covenant with better promises and better blessings? Doesn't that mean that the woman's position should be better in the New Testament? If you still got a problem with it, we wrote a book about it. You can go pick it up for five bucks, invest in your theology, and read it, okay? We'll just stop right there. That's good. So Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, was judging Israel at that time. Back on trail, back on track, okay? Back to what we're talking about, humble faith, okay? Verse number five, and she would sit under the palm tree of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the mountains of Ephraim, and the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. So if they had a problem, hey, let's go talk to Deborah about this. And they go, up, what do you think, Deborah? She says, slap them around, you know, hey, stop it. You do this, you do that. This is what I'm thinking about this. This is what the Spirit of God says. This is what you should do, okay? So they came to her for judgment at that time. Verse number six, then she sent and called for Barak. Now we're introduced to this man who Hebrews, the 11th chapter, says is a man of faith. It says, she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinoam from Kadesh and Natali, and said to him, has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, go and deploy troops at Mount Tabor, take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and the sons of Zebulun, and against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon, and I will deliver him into your hand. So right there, Deborah lays out the battle plan. She tells Barak exactly what's going to happen. You're going to go and you're going to gather 10,000 men from two of the tribes of Israel. You're going to go out there and you're going to assemble at a certain place, this mountain. While you're there on the mountain, God himself will assemble Sisera and all the chariots to the river. And by this river, there was a plain. So they would have had the military advantage in this battle. Now, Barak shows us, if we're going to go through the story, now, we can't read every verse. Well, you know what? We don't have church till 6 o'clock tonight. So why don't we take the next five hours, and we'll just go through the whole story verse by verse. Is that okay? Uh, some of you guys would stay for it. The rest of you guys are saying, Pastor, I need to get to lunch. So uh, we'll, we'll just move on. But we're going to go through the story, and we'll, we'll, we'll cover all the basics of the story. But I would encourage you this week, read through Judges chapter 4, read through Judges chapter 5. Let the Spirit of God teach you the rest of the story, okay, and, and, and apply it to your life. But as we see what Barak did, we see how Barak got a victory and how Barak humbled himself in faith under the word of God. And now, Deborah's name it wasn't mentioned in the Hall of Faith. Barak's name was mentioned in the Hall of Faith. How did he do it? How did he get the victory that he needed at that time? How did he gain what God had called him to do and do great and mighty exploits despite his flaws? See, it, you need a victory in your life. You need a victory in your marriage. You need a victory in your family. 
You need a victory for those teenage kids. Come on, somebody. Say, say amen to that. You need a victory in your business. Some of you guys are coming to the place believing for breakthrough in your finances. Some of you guys are addicted and afflicted, and you need to be freed from that bondage of sin, and you need a humble faith that gets you the victory. So as we take a look today at the Word of God and we find out what Barak did, then we can model his faith and we can get the results that Barak got, that God wants us to get in our lives. Are you listening today? Humble faith. Okay, so I'm going to say this. Humble faith, and I'm going to complete a sentence a couple of times for us today just to see what humble faith does that gets us to the victories that God has for us. Humble faith, number one, does this. Values the presence of God above all else. Humble faith values the presence of God above all else. Remember, Israel was sinning in a time of peace. It wasn't in a time of trouble that they sinned. It was a time of peace that their hearts separated from God. And they only sought the Lord in their troubles. Church, let's learn the lesson. Don't wait until you've got a problem to pray. Don't wait until you've got a trial to get to your knees. Don't wait until the stuff hits the fan, if I can use those terms, in order for you to run to church. We need to be pressing into God all the time and value the presence of God above our comforts, above our family, above our finances, above our future, above all else. I want the presence of God. You've got to see God at all times. The, the Psalms, I, I found this great verse in Psalm 27, verse 8 in the Amplified Bible. Now, you probably didn't bring an Amplified Bible to church today, but I'll put it up on the overheads for you. And we'll read it together. Maybe you got your device and you're looking on. You can switch over to that, that version. Psalm 27, verse number 8 in the Amplified says this. When you said, this is the psalmist. He's speaking to God. And he says, God, when you said, seek my face. Now, the Amplified takes those terms in the Hebrew or in the Greek, and it just brings more out of it. That's why it's called the Amplified. It amplifies the meaning for us. So, God, when you said, seek my face in prayer, this is what you meant. Require my presence as your greatest need. In other words, I don't need money. I need God. I don't need friends and family. I need God. I don't need wisdom and knowledge and understanding. I need God. See, in, in prayer, seek my face. Require my presence as your greatest need. Now, the response, the humble faith response of the psalmist is this, my heart said to you, the response was this, your face, O Lord, I will seek on the authority of your word. In other words, God, when you said seek my face, I said your face I will seek. That's what I need to do, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to require your presence as my greatest need. See, church, when you wake up in the morning, first thing should be, God, I need you. God, come, welcome, Holy Spirit, come and lead me this day. God, guide me throughout my day. God, I need wisdom. God, I, I need wisdom from you. God, I need your presence. God, unless you show up, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen. God, I will not be satisfied till I awaken in your likeness. God, I, I need Jesus. I need to be with you. I need the presence of the Holy Spirit. I need your comfort. I need your communion. I, I, need, I need your face. God, I'm seeking it out. Don't be too proud to ask for help. We got this society these days, I can do it on my own. I, I'll get mine, right? I, I'm going to do me, and it's all good. And I don't need no help from nobody. I did it my way, right? We, we've got this independent thought, and yet God says, don't be so proud. Why? Because God opposes the proud. But he gives grace to the humble. When you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, now all of a sudden God comes on the scene, and God comes and does great and mighty things on your behalf. Don't be too proud to ask God for help. God, I need you. Listen, you couldn't even save yourself. You were sunk in sin. You were headed to hell in a handbasket on a grease pole, and you were going down fast, and God reached out. You said, Lord, save me, and immediately Jesus was there reaching out and snatching you out of the flames. And now that you're saved, you get in church, you get your Bible, you start getting a handle on it, and all of a sudden you think you can do it yourself. No, you can't. You need Jesus. There's no deliverance without Jesus. There's no victories without Jesus. There's no prosperity without Jesus. There's no wisdom without Jesus. He's the wisdom of God on our behalf. There's nothing without Jesus. I told you, get your hankies ready. Judges chapter 4, verse number 8, Barak is speaking. He hears the word of the Lord. He has the assignment from God. He could have just gone and done the will of God. He could have just gone and got the victory. 
But look at what he does. Judges chapter 4, verse number 8. And Barak said to her, if you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. Now, I've read every commentary that I could find on the life of Barak. I went through and I read it all. Most of these guys think that Barak is a wimp because he said, I want a woman to go with me in the battle. Like he needs his mama. But can I tell you something? Barak was not being wimpy. Barak was not asking a woman to go with him into battle. Yes, in the natural we could say that. But Barak had just heard the word of the Lord from the prophet who represented God. Remember we talked about this. So who is he asking? Is he asking a woman or is he asking the representative of God on the earth at that time? I need Jesus. I need you. I need the commander of the Lord's army. I need God and his word. I need you to go with me. But God, if you don't go with me, I'm not going. See, Barak had a humble faith. He recognized he needed the presence of God, not just orders from God. He needed the presence of God to go with him. That's why he valued the presence of Deborah, because she represented God on the earth at that time as the prophet. And so he says, if you go with me, I'll go. If you don't go with me, I'm not going. Now, did he have any biblical basis to do this? Yes, because remember, as an Israelite, he would have learned the first five books of the Bible. He would have learned the Old Testament. He would have heard about Moses and the story of Moses. Remember when Moses was about ready to go in the promised land and God says, okay, Moses, get ready. You're going to go up and inherit the promised land. But listen, Moses, I'm not going with you because you have a rebellious people with you. And if I go with you, I will wipe them out. In essence, God is telling Moses, the kids are rowdy. And if I get in the room with them, I'm going to kill them. <laughs> Any other parents can identify with that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good. I'm not the only one. Just yesterday, I heard the kids screaming in the rooms. I said, boys, if I come in there, you are not going to like it. <laughs> but what does Moses respond? Exodus chapter 33, verse 15. Moses speaks to God. Then he said to him, if your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. God, don't take us anywhere if you're not going. I need your presence. Your presence, your presence is my greatest need. I require it, God. I don't want anything else. I want you, your presence. You are my son. You are my shield. You are my exceeding great reward. You are my shield. You are my buckler. You are my front guard and my rear guard. You are above and beneath. You are to my right hand and to my left. God, you surround me. The angel of the Lord encamps about me. The spirit of God lives on the inside of me. God, I need you in your presence. I'm going to make a statement. I want you to get a hold of this. The blessings of God are meaningless without God. In other words, God, don't bless me if you're not going to be with me. I don't need money. I need God. See, I could have all the wealth, all the riches, all the money in the world, and without God, it's meaningless. That's what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about. Listen, guys, I could have the best business. I could be the most successful, and without God, it's going to someone else, and when I die, it's meaningless. It didn't make any impact. It didn't have any difference. Who cares without God? Listen, family's important. I love my family. I would lay down my life for my family. But without God in my family, it doesn't make a difference. Because we could have the best family. We could all love one another and love all the cultures and love all the people. We could have the most in-line kids that never sinned and never did anything wrong. And without Jesus, we will fail and we will go to hell and it will make no difference. We need the presence of God in every area of our life. The blessings of God are meaningless without God. Humble faith. Values the presence of God above all else. Number two, the second thing for today is humble faith chooses unity over personal glory. Humble faith will always choose unity over personal glory. What do I mean by that? Judges chapter 4, verse number 9, right after Barak tells Deborah, I need you to go with me. And if you don't go, I won't go. Look at what Deborah says back to him. So she said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Then Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. Now, stop right there for a moment. Deborah says, Barak, if you do this, if I go with you, there's no glory for you in it. You're not going to get any kudos. You're not going to get any credit. 
God's going to sell Sisera, this guy with the 900 chariots, the commander of Jabin's army. He's going to sell him into the hand of a woman. Now, we would have thought that would have been Deborah, right? We would have thought Deborah would have came in with a sword and cut his head off or something like that. But that doesn't happen. The story goes on, and you can read it on your own time, that uh, here Barak gathers up the army. He goes up to the mountain. God gathers Sisera and his chariots and his army down in the plain down by the river, right? And so now Deborah says to Barak, hey, the Lord has gone before you. Go in and fight the battle. So Barak raids the army of Sisera jumps down on him and completely wipes him out, right? Even though they had the military advantage. If you read in Judges chapter 5, you'll find out there was a storm that came up. There was rain. There was mud. The chariots couldn't, couldn't go anywhere. And so the children of Israel just come in and they wipe them out. Now, Sisera sees he's beat. And so Sisera jumps out of his chariot and he starts to run on foot away. Now, there's a little side story about a lady by the name of J.L., Jael is a Kenite, okay? This is Moses' father-in-law's family, okay? They're called the Kenites. They live in the area around Israel, and they were friendly to Israel, but they were also friendly with the Canaanites. So this lady Jael, her husband had moved them. His name is Heber. He, he had moved them out to this one spot, and they were close to where the battle was. Now, I don't know where Heber was. Heber was somewhere else, but he was off on his own. And Jael was there, and, and the, in, in the tribes that time, the women had their own tent that they pitched beside the men's tent, okay? So they had their own space. And so it was uh, indecent for any man to go into a woman's tent without her permission, okay? So here comes Sisera. He's running up, and he runs by the tent of Jael, this little lady, this Kenite, not an Israelite. She's friends with the Israelites, but also friends with the Canaanites, and so here comes Sisera running up, and she says, come in, my Lord, come in. And she invites him into her tent. So he runs into the tent, he lays down, he's exhausted from the battle, he's exhausted from running, and he says, please give me some water to drink, I'm thirsty. But she didn't bring him water, no, she did him one better, she brought him milk. She brought it in a bowl, she brought it, and at the time, it was the curds, you know what I mean? So she gave him a meal. She gave him something that was nourishing, she gave him some warm milk. Anybody ever been tired? And you had a cup of warm milk, right? And you just slept like a baby all night long, right? Because it was just filling your belly. So she fills up his belly. She gives him the best. She gives him the cream. She gives him the milk, right? The curds, all that kind of stuff. And so he's there. And as he's drifting off, he says, if anybody comes to the door, just, and they ask if there's anybody, just tell them no, there's no, nobody in here. And he falls asleep. So JL tiptoes over, and she grabs a tent peg in one hand, and she grabs a hammer in the other hand. She tiptoes over to Sisera. She draws back the blankie that she had laid over him. She puts it to his temple and whack! She drives it straight through his temple. That's in your Bible. Anybody thinks that the Bible is wimpy or for sissies? You better read again because there are some stories in there that will make your blood curdle. Oh, my goodness. Talks about everything in the Bible. So she takes this guy and splits his head with a tent peg. Just wham, right through his temple. Kills him. He dies right there at her feet. Now, Barak comes running up. Remember, Barak was in the battle. Barak was in the heat of battle. And he comes chasing Sisera. And she stands at the tent door and she waits. And Barak comes running up and she says, Hey, come here. Let me show you something. And she pulls the blanket back. And there is the enemy of Israel lying on the ground, dead with a tent peg through his head. And in the song that happens in Judges chapter 5, they say, Blessed is Jael among women. The only other woman to receive that blessing was Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus Christ, because she was an instrument used of God to bring about the victory that God wanted. That's really what this is all about. The glory went to this little lady because she followed the will and the way of the Lord. It's amazing to me, but Barak didn't care. You know what you don't see in the Bible? You don't see Barak saying, wait a second, Deborah, what? A woman's going to get the credit? Never mind. You stay here and keep judging. I'm going to go do my thing. Never see that. Barak doesn't say, oh, man, I missed it. No, Barak says, I don't care. Come on, let's go. Let's do what we need to do. We've got a battle to fight. He did not care about his personal glory or his own exaltation. He sought the victory for the kingdom of God. See, humble faith doesn't care about who gets the credit. It doesn't matter. That's why when I hear about other churches growing and being blessed, in the flesh there might be a little envy, but then I tell my flesh, shut up. Listen, every church should be growing. Every church should be blessed. Every church should have a great facility. Every church should have great lights and sound. Every church should be filled with people who are serving and worshiping Jesus. I pray for the churches, not because it's the thing to do, not because Pastor Jim started, but because I'm conditioning my heart to say, I don't care who gets the credits. Jesus gets the credits. 
Galatians chapter 3, verse 28, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Listen, God has given us a level playing field. There's no longer classes, there's no longer uh, social and economic status, there's no longer educated and uneducated, right side of the track, wrong side of the track, the right and the left, Democrat, Republican, pedestrian, it doesn't matter. What matters is we are one in Christ and we need each other and who cares who gets the credit? Matthew Henry said this, he said, the greatest and the best are not self-sufficient, but they need one another. Every Magic Johnson needs a Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Oh, you guys aren't Laker fans? Okay. Uh, every, every Michael Jordan needs a Scottie Pippen. Hallelujah. Every, uh, how about some football, right? Every Joe Montana needs a Jerry Rice, right? Not sports fans? Every Simon needs a Garfunkel. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Uh, oh, okay, let's, let's speak to the ladies. We've been talking about everything else. Every Tom Hanks needs a Meg Ryan. Hallelujah. Come on. Isn't that right? Well, listen, we need each other. I need your gifts. I can't do this on my own. This is not come and listen to the preacher and how great he did and how big of a church he built. No, I cannot build this church. You and 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 you with your gifts, you build the church. I got my job, you got your job. I've got my assignment, you got your assignment. We need each other. You need me to preach and to teach and to pastor. You need me to lead. But listen, leaders need followers, right? Not everybody could be a leader. Otherwise, you, we'd all be up on the stage wondering, why isn't there anybody in church today? I just happen to be the biggest fool who will just follow Jesus and say, follow me as I'll follow Christ. I don't know what I did. I don't know what, anything other than God selected me and said, you be the guy. I said, all right, let's go. He said, Luke's with you. All right, let's go. You, your parents, Pastor Jim and Deborah, found any pastors. They're not going anywhere. They're with you. All right, let's go. All these people, they've got gifts you need. All right, let's go. Let's do it. God needs your gifts of administrations. He needs your gifts of giving. He needs your gifts with the kids. He needs your favor with the youth. God needs you to do computers over there at the check-ins. God needs you to have that mercy heart and love people in the FTC. God needs your heart for missions. He needs it. God wants you out there loving people to life. God needs your evangelistic heart. God needs your gifts. God needs your talents. God needs you to dance. God needs you to do finances. God needs you to do something. God needs you to get mobilized and get going in church. We need each other. See, independence will isolate us. If we think I can do it on my own, you're going to get isolated and the devil's going to take you out. But dependence on God, humble faith, and interdependence on one another is what will get us to the victory. See, independence says, I, I don't need anybody but myself. I can do it. Dependence says, I need you. I, I need God. But interdependence says, we need each other. We're the body of Christ, and every joint supplies, every person does their part, and now all of a sudden it causes growth to the body. And unity is not uniformity. I can't be you any more than you can be me. We can only be who God has called us to be. You can be anything God has called you to be if you will humble yourself and follow him in faith. So you never see Barack saying, okay, Deborah, go, go fight the battle. Go ahead, you came with me for a reason. You go out there and you lead the army. No, Barack led the army. He just wanted the presence of God. But Barack knew his place. He knew he was supposed to go, and he was supposed to win the victory. And Deborah never said, Barack, if I'm going with you, let me just do this. Get out of the way. She never does that. She never usurps the place of authority that God had given Barack. Barack was the leader of the army. She was the prophetess and the judge. They had their own individual position. Can we take another rabbit trail for a second? Men and women. Can we do this? Can we go there? We need to go there. All right, so we're going there anyways. Buckle up, because it's going to get real. Men... You need to be men. Let's try this side. That's a very feminine clap, by the way. Let's go. Men, you need to be men. I had the ladies all at the house on Thursday. They did their big day. Had over 1,000 women in church on Thursday. That was great. We should celebrate that. That's wonderful. Cheryl Salem was over at the house, and she said, y'all have any hairspray? And her big, southern, beautiful voice and accent, right? And I said, oh, yeah, so I went and got some hairspray, and I noticed I'm out of my stuff, you know, but I got all this other stuff from my wife, and it's all the, the glittery, glittery, shiny, you know, stuff. I used that one time. I was so ashamed because I had glitter all up in my hair. 
And I was hiding, like, somebody got a hat I can wear, you know? Wouldn't go out until I washed it several times. And so I said, yeah, here, I got all this girly stuff. Here you go. Because, listen, men don't have glittery, shiny hair. Okay? If we ever go on TV, I'm not putting on makeup. I'm a man. I, I don't do eyeshadow and eyeliner and blush and lipstick and makeup. I know this is politically incorrect, but we need to stop being so politically correct. You get politically correct around me, I'm going to start slapping you. Just stop it. Just stop it. Listen, just, just, just stop it. No. Don't, don't do it. Come on. Men need to be men. God has designed us to be strong, to be focused, to be stubborn, and sometimes stupid, because that's what God needs us to be. If there were no stupid risk takers, there'd be no guts, there'd be no glory. We need men to stand up and be men. Don't give me this sissy stuff. Don't give me that crap. Listen, you might be a designer as a man, that's fine. Be a manly designer. Okay? That, that's okay. You might be a hairstylist as a man. That's okay. You don't have to look like a woman to be a male hairstylist. You can be a man, show some chest hair. You can have a gold chain. That's fine. But be a man. Okay? In the same way, women, be a woman. Please. You don't have to be a man. It's the man's job to be the head of the house, to be the spiritual authority, to be the leader in the home, and it's the woman's job to come alongside that, encourage that, and yes, you might be more spiritual, and yes, you might be able to prophesy and declare the word of God, but then don't try and get in there and take over. Let the man do that. You be a woman. Women, wear glitter in your hair, okay? Men like that. We like shiny hair on women. Please, do the nails, do the makeup, paint the barn, ladies, okay? We like it when you look good. You say, my man likes me au natural. Okay, go au natural then. If that's what he likes, you go, girl. But you be a woman. Men like curves. Be curvy. It's okay. Sometimes women are trying to be so rail thin and skinny, but men like little meat on some bones sometimes. Okay? Be a woman. Be soft. Be pretty. Be, smell nice. Men may not smell nice. That's okay. We can do that. We're men, right? We want you to smell nice, though. We want to come home and smell lasagna in the oven. Oh, glory to God. Or cookies bacon. Hallelujah, girl. Okay? Make your homes a piece of heaven. Make them soft. Make them pretty. Make them frilly. Make them comfortable so that when the man comes home, Man, he's got a piece of heaven and he's got a woman there by his side. You know, men be men, women be women. Women, if the man's not doing his job, you do 1 Peter chapter 3, okay? Read that through and just follow the word of God so that he, without a word, will see the word of God in your life and he will submit to it and he will obey it even though he doesn't have the word of God. You do your part, he does his part, God does his part, and God gets the glory. Hello. You still like me? I love you. Final thing is this. Humble faith glorifies God in the victory. Glorifies God in the victory. See, Barak came in and he saw what happened. He saw the victory handed to him. And then Barak and Deborah break out in a song, break out in a duet that's only rivaled by a Bollywood movie ending or a season finale on The Voice. They start to sing. They start to dance. They start, I mean, I could just picture all the, you know, synchronized swimmers jumping into the pool and all that kind of, I mean, it's just, it, it's amazing. Okay, read through it. Like I said, Judges chapter 5. This song, it's a great song. And as they break out in song, they start to declare the works that the Lord has done. See, in our lives, God has handed us the victory. Jesus has pulled back the curtain. He has pulled back the blanket. And he has shown us your sin is nailed to the ground. Your sin is nailed to the cross. It's dealt with. I'm handing you the victory. And we need to break out in song and declare the praises of the Lord God Almighty. Look at Judges chapter 5. Turn there with me for a second. Look at verse number 3. Look at what Barak and Deborah start to sing. Hear, O kings. Give ear, O princes. I, even I, will sing to the Lord. I will sing praise to the Lord God of Israel. Listen, they're saying, everybody, come around. Everybody, listen up. Give me some elbow room. I'm about ready to get my praise on. Come on, somebody. Listen to what's going on. I'm going to sing to the Lord. I'm going to give praise to the Lord God Almighty. See, what has God done? 
in your life? What has God delivered you from? What has God brought you out of? What has God brought you to? What is God doing in your life? God has given you a victory. He has handed it to you. And you better praise him. You better tell somebody about it. You better gather up the kids. Gather up the family. Gather up the friends. Gather up the neighbors. Listen, I'm about ready to get my praise on. I'm going to tell somebody about the great works of Jesus in my life. I'm going to tell somebody that God is good. That God is on the throne. That God has delivered me. He saved me. He raised me. He delivered me. He cleaned me up. He set my feet upon the rock. And God is my righteous king. And God is going to do great things in your life. And God will deliver you. And God will deliver your family. Somebody in this place better praise him today. Stand to your feet if you're sitting down. Come on, stir yourself. Tell somebody about Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise him. Praise him. Praise him in this place. Lift up Jesus in this place. Somebody declare the greatness of God. You were healed. You were delivered. You were on drugs. You were broken. And yet Jesus came and he saved you and he raised you and he delivered you and he blessed you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on and praise him. Glory to God. Glory to God. Woo. Now listen, this isn't only for church. Go be that guy. Go be that girl. Go be that crazy out there telling somebody about you. God delivered me. You, you need to hear what the Lord has done. You need to know my story so that you can give him some glory. Come on, somebody. You need to go and tell someone about Jesus. These seats that are empty, they're, they're going to be filled up with people because God is doing something here at The Rock. This church is growing. This church is dynamic. This church is reaching out. This church is dynamic. This church is a great godly church that's proclaiming the praises of Jesus. Humble faith. Humble faith values the presence of God above all else. Humble faith chooses unity over personal glory. Doesn't care who gets the credit. Doesn't bother, doesn't mind asking for help. But values the gifts of others. And humble faith gives God the glory. Can somebody in this place give him some praise today? <laughs> Hallelujah. Have a seat. Have a seat. Some of you guys in this place, if you died right now, you'd go to hell. I want you to listen up. Nobody get up, no one leave during this time. Stay put. Because I want to make sure you don't leave this place headed for hell. I want to make sure that you're headed for heaven. God loves you so much, he sent Jesus beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross. He took what was ours. Took our sin. Took our shame. Took it upon himself. Took the punishment of God upon himself so that we could live. And now he offers to us heaven. Eternity with him. That we don't have to be away from the presence of God, but we can value the presence of God and have the presence of God for eternity. Today, he's offering you that free gift of salvation. And you're not saved, and you don't go to heaven just because you came to church. A lot of times people think, if I just go to church, stand up and shout at the preacher, have a good Holy Ghost moment, do a little Pentecostal jig that I get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. You're not going to go to heaven. You're going to die and go to hell if that's how you think you're going to heaven, just because you sat in church, call yourself a Christian. Some of you in this place think, well, you know, I've done a lot of good deeds over my lifetime. Help people out, given money to charities, got involved in social justice causes. Do you know you can't be good enough? Don't the Bible say, just be good and you get to go to heaven. Isn't that shocking? We think God's on an honor system of some sorts. Like there's a grading scale or a curve or a line you have to be above. Just be this good and you get to go to heaven. And yet it doesn't work like that. Some of you in this place said, well, I was raised in church. Parents told me we were Christians growing up. Hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. Had you baptized as a Christian as a child? Went to religious classes like Sunday school or catechism class, maybe Sabbath school class. You've always thought of yourself to be a Christian. Born in America, America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhists, Muslims, Hindus. We're Christians, right? Wrong. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible say your parents raised in church tell you're a Christian that makes you a Christian? Nowhere in the Bible say your religious activity or your location where you're born gets you into heaven. And God doesn't look at your life and say, well, they're not anything else. I guess I'll just put them in the category of being a Christian. You get to go to heaven. It doesn't work like that. Come on, let's talk about your eternal life. Your eternal destiny is at stake. Because if that's how you think you're going to get to go to heaven, you're not going to make it. Everybody, please remain seated. Your eternal life's at stake. The devil's trying to distract you right now. Just focus in on what God is speaking to you. 
what makes you think you're going to heaven. Sometimes people think they're going to heaven because they know who God is. Someone told them, if you just know God, do you know God? I know God. Celebrate Easter, celebrate the resurrection, celebrate Christmas every year of my life. You quote scriptures, Old and New Testament. I, I believe that that makes me a Christian. But do you know that demons believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God? They're not Christians. The devil himself knows who Jesus is and can quote scriptures. You'll read that in your Bible. And yet he's not a Christian headed for heaven. So everybody look up here at me for a second. It's not about what you have in your head. It's not about having mental ascent towards God, knowing who Jesus is, and that gets you right with God. But rather, this is about your heart. Here's the real question today. Have you given God all of your heart? And have you given God all of your life? Because if not, I love you enough to tell you the truth. You're not going to make it. And today, if you were to die, and this was your last day on the earth, you would end up in hell rather than in heaven. See, but pastor, I don't really believe in hell. I think that's just a fairy tale people made up. Well, really, it's in the Old and New Testament. Jesus himself spoke of it. It's a very real place. And I want to make sure you don't go there. You want to make sure you don't go there. But listen, most of all, God wanted to make sure. That's why he sent Jesus beaten, bloody, and hung on a cross so that we could go to heaven and be with him forever. You say, well, didn't Jesus open the way? Didn't he make it wide and expansive? Everybody can come in now. Don't all roads lead to heaven because now Jesus has gone to the cross? Well, no. In fact, if you read your Bible, you know, Jesus doesn't say the way is wide and open and expansive. In fact, Jesus said the way is narrow and hard to find. And there are few who find it. Today, I want to shine some light on the path for you. Jesus said this. He said, you must be born again. I know, crazy, weirdo. You've seen it in movies, television, Hollywood, books, and the internet. Read about it on a blog. Somebody weird was born again. You don't want to be like that. Listen, God's not asking you to be weird. He's asking you to be born again. Because unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said in John, the third chapter, you must. Not it's a nice suggestion, it's a good thought. No, you must be born again if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven. So what does being born again really mean? Does it mean what Hollywood and movies and television tell us? No, it means what the Bible says about it. What does being born again really mean? Well, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, it's always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's just that simple. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you. Last book of the Bible, book of Revelation. Jesus is speaking to a church, just like he's speaking to us here in this church today. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Those are pretty descriptive words from the mouth of Jesus. Pretty gross, pretty graphic. What's he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, little out. A little up, little down, a little token prayer every now and again. An occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus, you're not going to make it. How do I know that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So today I'm going to give you an opportunity. Jesus made this statement. He said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. But if you deny me, I will deny you. Today, your call, your choice. You can sit there and do nothing, and you made your choice. Or you can respond to the call of God simply by doing what I'm about ready to tell you. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. When I say three, I'm going to pop my hands together. Bang. When you hear that sound, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to give God all my heart. I want to give God all my life. I want to be born again, headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You might be thinking, whoa, 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 wait a second. Time out. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. People just saw me standing on my feet praising God, and now I'm saying that I'm not saved. Ugh, I can't do that. Listen, you can. You can, because this is a safe and friendly church service. People around you, they love you. They're praying for you right now. We're excited for you. We want you to do this. We've all done it as well. There's no shame, no guilt, no condemnation in this place. No one's judging you, criticizing or condemning you. We're excited for you. We're family. We're encouraging you right now to do this. But even if you are embarrassed, isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Listen, no one would make that trade. A moment of possible embarrassment for an eternity away from God? Come on. And yet the devil's trying to talk you out of it right now. Your flesh is trying to hold you back. Listen, push past the flesh. Tell the devil, go jump in a fiery lake. You're going on with God today. Simply raising your hand in a moment. All across this auditorium, back in the family rooms, I see you guys back there. Get ready to get your hands up if that's you. If you're watching out there in the foyer or down in the Love Rock Cafe by television, come on, put the burger down. Get ready to get your hand up in the telling usher right afterwards. Or if you're in the foyer, come into the church service. Online, wherever you're at, across the nation, around the world, get ready to get your hand up. God sees and God's watching. And then you can minimize your video browser and click the button that says, 
respond to God or go to our homepage, rockchurch.com, and click the button that says, How to Know God, and someone will lead you in a prayer right where you're at. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Today is your day. Make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this before, never given God all of your heart, never given God all of your life? I'm speaking to you. Or finally, who should raise their hand? If you're lukewarm in the place, you know that's the condition of your heart when I described it. Get ready to get your hand up. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high for me right now if that's you. If that's you. Thank you. There's one, two, three. Thank you. God bless you. Four, five, six, seven. God bless you guys. Eight back in the family. I've got you over there. Eight wise people already. Eight. I got you right there. Nine. Thank you. God bless you. Nine wise people already. Got you. Ten over there. Thank you. Ten. Eleven. Got you. Got you. Eleven and twelve. Got you over there. Thank you guys. Who else today? Twelve wise people already. Twelve. Twelve wise people already. Thank you. Thirteen. Fourteen. Got you guys up there. You can put your hands down. Fourteen wise people already. Fifteen in the family room. Got you. Thank you. Thank you right there. Got you. God bless you. Thanks for the help with the wave. Anybody else real quick? There's 15 wise people. Now, we could stop right there and give a hallelujah. But I know there's 10 more of you that you need to give your heart and life to Jesus. So here's what I'm going to do. We've gone a little late. Can I, can I just take some time and win some souls? Is that okay with everybody? Will you guys give me a couple more minutes of your time? Thank you guys for joining with me in this. I'm going to invite everybody that raised their hands. I'm going to invite you to the front, okay? We're all going to stand. We're all going to welcome you. No one's going to leave at this time. We're respecting the move of the Holy Spirit that's about ready to take place as God draws men and women to himself. If you raised your hand back there in the children, the, the family rooms, if you're a child, raise your hand, bring them at this time. Uh, all the way up in the back, if you're on the sides, wherever you're at, if you're in the foyer and you raised your hand, this is the time. We're all going to stand. We're going to welcome you. We're going to give you a clap and a shout. As we do that, Reverend Elijah is going to lead us in a song. As he sings that, that's your cue. Get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. Get in the aisle and meet me up front because we're going to change destinies today. Now listen, if you didn't raise your hand, you're one of those ten. You should have, but you didn't. You get your stuff and you come right now because the Spirit of God is drawing you. Come right now. Come on, let's welcome them. You come. They're coming. Come on, you can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. you can come too. From the family rooms, bring your children. They'll remember this. From the foyer, come on in at this time. From the back rows, if you raise your hand. Front to back, left to right, wherever you're at. Come on, this is your time. Even if you didn't raise your hand, you can come too right now. You can come too. Come on. Come on, they're still coming. Come on, they're still coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. Let's encourage them. They're still coming. You can come too. Don't let up now, church. Come on. Come on. Come on. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment. So glad you guys have came. Okay, now there's... The 15 up here, but remember, I said there was 10 more you need to come. Oh, wow, look at this. Look at this. Come on, you guys. Come on, you guys. They're coming. Okay. They're coming. They're coming. Okay. Just real quick, I don't want to embarrass anybody. How many of you are coming for salvation right now of, of this group? So there's one there. Two there, three there, okay, three. Okay, so wait, 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 wait. Shh, 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 shh. You guys are so excited. I love you guys. Okay, how many are coming from this group? Okay, they're coming. Okay, are all five of you guys giving your hearts to the Lord? All five of you guys? Okay, all right. Three plus five equals eight. I said ten. There's two more. Here's one. Hold on. Okay, one more, come in.
Spirit of God just spoke to me. There's two more. There's two more. You need to come right now. All weekend, Sabbath service, first service, I've called out numbers and people have not come. Listen, you are not guaranteed tomorrow. We saw that in the news this morning. We saw that in the news last week. We saw that in the news the week before last. We saw that in the news December 2nd, just down the street from here. You are not guaranteed tomorrow. If you need to come, there's, are both of you guys coming? Him? Okay, that's one. That's one. Okay. One more. One more. You need to come. Come on. There's one more. Who are you? You need to come. Come on. This is your time. It's no shame. If you need to come, just get out. If you're wrestling on the inside, stop it. Submit to God. Humble yourself. You can't do this on your own. Don't be so proud. I can say to myself, I'm fine. I'm good. I've got this. I'll take care of myself first and then I'll come to God. No, you won't. You can't do it. Humble yourself and come. If that's you, you need to come. Just make your way to the front right now. There's one more. They're coming. Come on, man. All right, hallelujah. There he is. Bless you, man. God is so good. God loves you so much. You know what else? I love you. And the people in this church, we love you. Welcome to the family of God here at the Rock Church Moral Lowry Center. All right, we want to lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus in your heart. You're going to be born again, okay? We want to get some information in your hands, what to do next now that you're a Christian. I'll also introduce you to someone in the church who will help you in your new walk with God. It's easy. It's free. Okay, nothing weird goes on. Okay, I'm about as weird as you're going to get today, okay? Right over here to my right, your left, is my friend, Pastor Joel. Pastor Joel is going to lead you in that prayer, get that stuff in your hands, talk to you about process what to do next now and then he'll let you come right back out your friends and family will wait for you if you guys will just make a left turn follow pastor joel let's give him a hand as they go hallelujah Woo. glory come on give god the praise today because he deserves it hallelujah